Good afternoon. It is a delight to share the lunchtime hour with, with all of you. Uh, my name is Ben Vinson. I am the provost and executive vice president here at Case Western Reserve University. And I want to thank again everyone for joining us this afternoon to the fifth installment of our North Star Seminar Series. This will be the final uh, uh, installment for this academic year. Now, for some of you who may have joined us for some of the, our previous events, you probably know why we're here today. Uh, but for some of you who may be first timers, let me just pause and tell you a little bit about, about us. We at Case Western Reserve University are driven by a vision that we call our North Star. Uh, and it simply states, Case Western Reserve is a high impact research university that aspires to be a community where humanity, science, and technology meet to create a just and thriving world. Now to help further that mission, we also highlight diverse people, diverse opinions, diverse ideas, but always with the goal of engaging in a dialogue that is civil and respectful. So that series, the series that you're engaging in today, the North Star Series Seminar, it's trying to do just that. We need conversations like the one we're about to have today. We need to keep civil discourse and learning alive in this institution and in our broader community and throughout the nation. And we're happy that you've joined us on this mission. Now today's talk is gonna focus on lessons for restoring and reframing civic dialogue in the aftermath of the racial shock in Minnesota, including the murder of George Floyd and subsequent civil unrest. With us today are two individuals who are leading change in the Twin Cities. But before we introduce them, uh, I have some people to thank for, uh, for coming out and for helping make this possible. First, from here at Case Western Reserve University, the Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence and our Office for Inclusion, Diversity and Equal Opportunity. We could not do this program without you. And to our friends at the Cuyahoga County Public Library, we are so grateful to everything that you do to support this event and for serving our community in so many ways. Your commitment to encouraging civic dialogue in our greater community, it's incredible and we appreciate everything you do. Rob Solomon, who is our Vice President for Inclusion, Diversity and Equal Opportunity. Rob, I know you're out there today. Uh, could you say a few words uh, of welcome to our audience? <laughs> sure, sure, thank you so much, Ben. Uh, and, and, and please, I, I join our Provost Ben Benson in welcoming each of you to our North Star Seminar Series today. And I'm certainly delighted to welcome um, uh, Mayor Melvin Carter and President Sue Rivera with us today. Uh, Sue being a, a dear friend of ours uh, of many years. For me, a few months before she, she took her current post. Our North Star Series serves to remind us uh, that diversity, inclusion, equity, and justice are essential to the excellence of our community our culture and our curriculum, and that that pursuit of excellence requires thoughtful, deliberate, sustained action uh, that, uh, that makes this critical to our educational mission. It reminds us uh, to value diversity in all its dimensions, including you know, gender, race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, learning abilities, socioeconomic status and viewpoint that we should seek to reflect these multiple perspectives, backgrounds, and interests in all facets of our community, and to recognize that students who are exposed to and embrace diversity are better prepared to engage in a pluralistic world. And we are reminded to strive to be an inclusive community in which each individual feels safe, respected, and valued and in building a community that values similarities and differences among its constituents, we can seek to embody in our actions and in our relations with one another, the principles of equity and justice, as well as the values of honesty, respect, compassion, responsibility, and fairness. And moreover, exposure to multiple and even sometimes competing points of view best equips our students to explore, understand, and apply complex concepts, building the basis for a rigorous education. 
And by weaving diversity into the fabric of our curriculum, we can equip our students and our entire community with the interpersonal and critical thinking skills that are essential to success in the complex multicultural world in which we live. So the seminar series is incredibly valuable uh, and we certainly thank you, uh, Ben, um, for introducing us to this series and convening us today. Welcome and thank you. Wow, Rob, thank you so much for, for that, uh, for having only been here uh, just over a year. I mean, you, you've got us down. So uh, def <laughs> definitely appreciate that. Um, let me now begin to introduce our uh, special guests. Melvin Carter is the 46th and first African-American -American mayor of the city of St. Paul, Minnesota. A fourth generation St. Paul resident, Mayor Carter leads with what he calls an unapologet unapologetic equity agenda. Since taking office in 2018, he has raised the city's minimum wage. He has tripled free program in rec centers. He's launched an office of financial empowerment, recognizing the importance of higher education. He's also introduced College Bound St. Paul, which is a plan to start every child born in the city with a $50 college savings account. As the son of a now retired St. Paul police officer, Mayor Carter also has a well-established commitment to police accountability and law enforcement reform. Now, in the wake of public consternation over a series of police shootings, which included the 2016 killing of Philando Castile in a St. Paul suburb, in 2019, he convened residents and local leaders to co-create a $3 million research-based public safety initiative. Now, speaking to PBS reporters last month, he said, quote, I am fortunate to serve a community that's already been all in on this work far before George Floyd was murdered. And we're gonna to continue to push that body of work forward. Passionate about helping others engage in civic processes, Mayor Carter has trained activists and candidates in over 30 states and commonly recites his administration's mantra, building a city that works for us all, that works for us all means we all must do the work. Mayor Carter, also my cousin, thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm honored to be here with you. I appreciate the invitation. Well, our, our next featured speaker uh, is going to be familiar to many of you here on the call this afternoon. It is a pleasure for me to say this. Dr. Suzanne Rivera is the 17th president of McAllister College in St. Paul. Now, of course, many of you know uh, her from her time here at Case Western Reserve, where she served as vice president for research and technology management, and also served on the faculty in the departments of bioethics and pediatrics. A national expert in research ethics, President Rivera frequently is invited to speak on a variety of topics related to biomedical research and science policy. She has published numerous articles, essays, book chapters that explore the moral dimensions of informed consent use of human specimens, and protection of research subject privacy. Now at McAllister, within one year, she's already drawn national attention uh, for, for her offer to cover bail and fines for students arrested for civil disobedience during protests in the wake of the killing of George Floyd. And according to Inside Higher Ed, that announcement was met with praise, criticism, and a violent threat. But she countered it saying, quote, the free exchange of ideas, even when done inconveniently, is one of the cornerstones of a liberal arts education. I would defend free speech for our conservative students as vigorously as for our liberal students. Sue, President Sue Rivera, thank you so much for being here this afternoon. Thank you, Provost Vincent. It's a pleasure to be with you and my CWU colleagues. And I'm also delighted to share the Zoom screen with Mayor Carter, someone I really admire and with whom I've had the pleasure to work on uh, improving the well-being of residents here in my new adopted home city of St. Paul. 
Well, we miss you, Sue. I, I, I will say that. So, uh, but we know you're thriving, and uh, uh, you've got a great partner uh, in, in in crime, so to speak, uh, with uh, with Mayor Carter. Uh, but to add another voice to today's conversation and to moderate our question and answer period, I also now want to introduce Dr. Shannon French. Dr. French is the Inamori Professor in Ethics. She is the director of the Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence. She is a tenured member of our philosophy department. And she also has a secondary appointment as a professor in the School of Law. She is an expert in military ethics and ethical leadership and has participated in public debates on ethical issues in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, NPR. And I can't even begin to count all of the different outlets, uh, Dr. French, that you've been appearing in, you know, raising up the roof for Case West Reserve University. So, Dr. French, thank you and welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I truly consider it a privilege to be part of this conversation with President Rivera and Mayor Carter. Uh, and uh, Sue, on a personal note, it's lovely to see you again. <laughs> and um, uh, Mayor Carter, I, I would also like to point out that uh, I spent eight years of my childhood in Minnesota. So, you know, I, I, I've got that Morris, Minnesota, about three hours northwest of y'all. So <laughs> you can tell I've lived other places, too, because I say y'all. <laughs> That's right. And you, you, we know Morris well. That's not too far from us. Ah, oh, I appreciate that. Uh, and this the conversation obviously is coming at such a vital moment uh, in, in, our, uh, in our nation, in our history. And it is urgent and it is important. And I coming at it as I do from the perspective also as an ethicist and particularly my work in military ethics, I'm fascinated to, to hear uh, what we all uh, think around issues with uh, police and the militarization of police. And certainly the work that I do has a lot to do with the importance of restraint and how not putting your own life first is actually vital to being the kind of guardian that we need. So that will be part of our, our uh, discussion as well. And thank you for this opportunity. Great to see you all here. Well, Shannon, I'm gonna go ahead and start, uh, start this off. Uh, if you can join me in this, uh, I'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, as is customary for our North Star seminars, we really wanna start by really getting a chance to understand both of you a bit better, uh, Mayor Carter, President Rivera. Uh, both of you have come of age now uh, in one of, what some could describe as perhaps one of the most complicated times in, in recent history. Uh, but both of you are powerful and, and, and effective leaders, that, and you're managing tremendous amounts of change. Uh, it, how have you gotten to your positions, and what was your, what was your inspiration for leadership? And, and what is the biggest single challenge, perhaps, that, that each of you face? Mayor Carter, you want to start? Sure, I'm happy to. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. First, I say like I'm excited about the opportunity to be virtually in Cleveland. My mother grew up in Cleveland, and so I used to come and spend uh, uh, summers uh, there, hanging out with my grandmother, who worked at Mount Sinai Hospital. My mother's a, a alumni of John Hay High, and so you know we we, we you know and love the Cleveland community well. I am hanging out here with my uh, chief of staff, so I'm trying to sneak and feed her a little bit of bananas on the side and see if I can bribe her into staying quiet while we uh, hang out and talk. Uh, but my wife is a healthcare provider, so uh, she's out there taking care of patients, and I'm here uh, trying to work from the from the dining room. The final thing I'll say by way of preamble, Ben, it's good. To, ben, Ben, let let spill the the beans that we're cousins, um, and I always say Ben is my cousin who I don't like because no matter what I do with my life, my mother will tell me, you ought to try to be more like Ben. You should, you know, Ben's doing this, Ben's the provost now, Ben is in, in Latin America. <laughs> and so all of my life I've heard, I, I, I could be Secretary General of the United Nations and my mother would say, you know, you should think about, go, go spend the summer with Ben. So uh, I, I have to let her know that, that Ben invited me somewhere. So I must have uh, uh, gotten some status in my life now. Um, my whole life has been my inspiration for leadership. My, my 14 month old is my inspiration for leadership. My life as a, 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 a black man growing up in Minnesota has been my inspiration for leadership. Uh, you mentioned that my father's a retired St. Paul police officer uh, and uh, the stories that he told as one of the first African-American officers 
who came on the department because of a lawsuit that required us to integrate our police department. Uh, and all of those African-American officers who came on with him, who I'd see at fight night and Super Bowl parties are an inspiration for me. Uh, the officers who I met after I turned 16 and started driving around our community uh, are an inspiration for leadership for me and, and just as much. Um, maybe one, if I had to point to like one central space that made me realize that I wanted to be a public leader, it was uh, attending uh, undergraduate uh, school at Florida a and University in Tallahassee, Florida during election 2000. If you remember Florida and, hang, and election 2000 and hanging chads and all of those types of things, uh, I was attending one of the largest historically black colleges in the country in the capital city of Florida at that time. And we first found out that something was wrong. Uh, because I wasn't one of those like super political students. Uh, I was, you know, running track and I was in business school and I was doing these things. And I remember thinking this is 2000 Bush v. Gore. And I remember thinking like, I'll probably go vote after class if I have time. Right. I was living with my older sister, her husband and their two year old daughter at the time. And my brother in law looked at me and said, hey, everybody who lives in this house is going to vote today. And so I got in the car. And we got there and it was record turnout for this Florida. It's a swing state. It's an open uh, election. And we uh, had to wait 30, 40 minutes in line. Uh, I always love to tell it embellishes the story. I always say it was a cold day, uh, but I'm a Minnesotan and that was in Florida. So I can only get away with so much of that. Um, but we stood out there in line. We got to the front of the line and I voted and my sister voted and my brother-in-law who made me get in the car, who stood in that line with his voter registration card in one hand and his two-year-old daughter in his other arm uh, got turned away from the polls. And we ultimately ended up finding out that hundreds of our classmates had gotten turned away from the polls with no greater explanation than your name is not on this list when it should, absolutely should have been. And we found ourselves in the middle of this international news story uh, where all of a sudden we were political. And my parents would call me and say, are you in class? Because I think I see you at C on CNN at the, <laughs> at the state capitol. Um, all I have to say is, I, 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 as mad as we were about that, we said they're arguing my brother's right to vote, you know, and as angry as we were, as frustrated as we were, as embarrassed as we were, uh, in the end, I think more than anything, it was difficult for me because uh, I couldn't figure out how to reconcile this experience of, you know, we talk about uh, 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 apathetic voters or cynical voters, uh, but, you know, the secret sauce of what makes us such an amazing country, uh, such an amazing democracy is that if you want to say, you get to say, you get to participate in this experience of my brother, the experience of hundreds of my classmates. Uh, ironically, our student government president at the time was a young guy, a close friend of mine named Andrew Gillum, who ran for governor in, uh, in Florida uh, a couple of years back. Uh, and continues to be an amazing friend and leader to this day. Um, and I think it, 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 it uh, launched a number of us into a space where we felt like um, doing well wasn't good enough, that we had to spend a career doing good. Uh, and I spend my life uh, prayerfully uh, working every day to ensure that nobody ever has to feel the way I felt at that uh, table, that sense of powerlessness that we felt at that table. I only answered the first question because I'd take the whole rest of the day to answer all those questions. What's our biggest challenge is helping is getting people to think differently about the same old problems and think about, you know, being able to say, you know, we have these same old problems that are generation problems, but we have these and we have these same old solutions that we're that we're used to and that are in our comfort zones. Uh, but if the solutions uh, are in our comfort zones, the problems that continue to perpetuate for generations, uh, maybe. Uh, those uh, comfort zone, historic, traditional solutions uh, are uh, uh, incompatible uh, with actually solving those kind of generational problems that continue to persist. So that's probably our biggest challenge, whether it's economic development, public safety, housing, library services, anything else. Wow, that, that is amazing. Uh, and I'm sure it resonates with so many of, uh, of members of our audience. Um, wow, what a journey. And uh, I'll, I'll also have to say, I did speak with your, your provost this morning over at AMU, uh, who also wanted to say hi as you know, one, of, one of the leading graduates of, of AMU. Uh, so uh, that, that pride is shining through and through. But let me pitch it back. Let me pitch it over to uh, President Rivera. How about you? Well, first of all, you can see why we all are so inspired by our mayor uh, from the answer that he just gave. So it's sort of hard to follow that up. But I'll you know, specifically, how did I get where I am and what, what lessons for leadership there? 
those of you at CWRU who know me pretty well know that I took a crooked path to this role. I, I started as a social worker, actually. I went to work for the federal government in the Head Start program. And I worked at multiple institutions of higher education before I even got to CWRU. I started as staff. Uh, I didn't go back for a PhD until I was 35 years old and had two school-aged kids at the time. And I worked a full-time job and did my doctoral studies at night. Um, and I did not grow up thinking I would someday be a college president. I, I did not have the audacity to imagine that I would be a college president. I was a public assistance kid. I was a free lunch kid. Uh, I went to college on a Pell Grant. Um, so for me, having the honor to serve in this way, to make the opportunity of higher education available for other students is a deeply profound privilege. Um, and in terms of feeling called to leadership, you know, I thought I was signing up for one job and I took a different job. I mean, the job I accepted when I agreed to come to McAllister was very different than the job I've been doing for the last year. It would be an understatement to say the last year has been challenging. I, I literally arrived here in St. Paul the week after George Floyd was murdered into a campus community and a city that were in deep pain. Uh, and I had to take the helm during a global pandemic following a leader who'd been here for 17 years. So when I was hired, I was told, this is gonna be so easy for a first presidency, turnkey operation, smooth sailing. Um, and instead I had to make all of these high stakes decisions under time pressure um, that upset a lot of people without a reservoir of trust and goodwill because people didn't know me or know my values. Um, so, you know, one important way I've, I've started to try to learn the job the job of president and learn the community here at Mac and learn the St. Paul community has just been to jump in. I, I've jumped into civic life. You know, to that end, I was honored and delighted when the mayor invited me to sit on a commission here charged with looking at our approach to policing and public safety, which is just releasing a report today. Um, but, but all of the, you know, I just have had to kind of step into leadership in ways that I wasn't necessarily prepared for because the moment called for it. And um, so I'm really looking forward to this dialogue with all of you today to, to, to figure out, you know, what are the next steps for restoring and reframing civic dialogue under these conditions? Because there's no playbook for this. The, the time we're living in right now, there's no sitting president who knew how to operate a college this year either. It's all, it's all required grit and, uh, you know, judgment and teamwork and patience and the ability to hold grief in ways that, that we were not prepared for and we've just had to do our best. Oh, I'd wow. like to follow up on that if, if I could. Um, and, and let's just stick with you for a, a moment, President Rivera. At, by the way, I'd just like to say, you may not have known it, but I remember from about the moment I met you, I thought she should be a <laughs> university president. <laughs> So, you know, destiny. Uh, but um, following up along these lines, and you know this matters to me as an ethics professor, what guides you as a leader? And I, I want to ask the same question in a moment to you, Mayor Carter. So if you want to be getting yours ready. Um, what guides you and what do you feel you have learned along your journey that prepares you for what you were speaking of a moment ago? addressing how we as Americans, as citizens, as an educated population, speak to one another in these particularly uh, challenging, and you're right, that word is inadequate yeah. times. I, well, you're right. I thought you and I were in the same department. So, you know, I've had the unusual advantage in this last year of deep scholarly training in ethics and bioethics, which most college presidents did not have as they navigated the pandemic and the civil rights crisis. So I think that gave me a framework, but while that training was helpful, I also feel like I was mainly guided as a leader by uh, personal values. You know, we heard these talked about already um, earlier, fairness, compassion, justice, respect. Um, I'm still learning how to operationalize those moral values in my day-to-day -day work as a college president. But I, I, you know, the other part of your question, Professor French, is really about how we speak to one another. And I think the thing we're still grappling with is, or at least I, I'll speak for myself and say what I'm still grappling with is, how do we make ourselves understood across differences? And how do we activate compassion about circumstances we may not personally understand? 
you know, we've, we've got to get to a point, I think, if we're going to really move forward as a society where we can say, okay, I haven't shared that particular experience, but I accept your truth. And I stand with you in solidarity because we share a vision for a more just and peaceful world. We've got to get there. Otherwise, these, these you know, divisions and silos are going to continue to impede our, our progress to make the kind of world I, I think the people on the Zoom screen wish for and envision. Thank you very much. And uh, Mayor Carter, if I may, I'd, I'd like to throw the same couple of questions there at you. And, and uh, just to remind you that, again, the point of what guides you and, and personally what, what has uh, been shown to you in your growth as a leader that you've learned. And, and then again, this question around how do we talk to each other? I think that's all really important. Um, what I think what drives me is um, I think sitting on this fulcrum between my children right on cue uh, and my parents uh, and this kind of uh, deep, hurtful, painful history that we have that in so many ways continues to perpetuate uh, and that keeps moving. You know, I, I have learned really well from my parents um, who are just some incredible individuals in their own right uh, to, 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 to be the one who's listening uh, when no one else is uh, to be the one who, you know, that I always I try to teach my children that uh, that uh, one of the reasons we win debates is because I'm listening to the other folks more closely than they're listening to me uh, to be the one who's willing to take a risk uh, when no one else is. Uh, because uh, again, my children, we're Minnesota. So I'm teaching my children how to ice skate right now. And the lesson I always teach them is uh, if your goal is to never fall, then you can never skate, right? You have to be willing to let go of that wall. You have to be willing to try. In the public sector, frankly, uh, we more often uh, kind of uh, lead from a notion of never falling uh, than thinking about how to fly, how to get our community, inspire our communities to fly. Uh, and that lack of risk taking is I think at the center of what perpetuates um, what perpetuates injustice, what perpetuates our disparities. But then at the core, and it's that mantra that Ben said at the beginning is this notion that like uh, building a city that works for us all means we all have to do the work. Um, I, I am the uh, descendant of what's called our Rondo neighborhood in St. Paul. Uh, and the, there's a Rondo neighborhood in just about every city. It's called something different, but we're the thriving African-American community that was uprooted destroyed to build a freeway uh, back when my father was a child. And this story played out everywhere from Pittsburgh, Detroit, uh, to Oakland and San Francisco and everywhere in our country. Just in St. Paul alone, uh, our version of that story uh, is estimated to have uh, cost nearly a hundred million dollars to, to, to rob nearly a hundred million dollars from my African-American community. And I believe that happened because our African-American community wasn't at the table for those conversations. So what really drives me is that experience at that table in Florida is the belief that uh, all decisions that have ever been made in the history of humankind have been made to benefit the decision maker. And if I disappear in my office, even as our first black mayor, uh, if I disappear in, our office, in my office and, and, and make decisions by myself, that that would be a road to a continuation of the status quo and not a path to a fundamentally better future. So that's where like that commission that uh, President Rivera uh, just is called fish, finishing up serving on today uh, is, is a part of this governance structure. And so everything we do, uh, we um, hired our cabinet through what we call our community-based hiring process. Uh, we set our city's budget uh, through what we call uh, our community-based budget games. We're the only, our police department is the only planet, is the only uh, law enforcement agency on the planet that I'm aware of that uh, did, uh, uh, rewrote uh, our use of force policies through a two month, two way conversation with community members. So what really drives me, uh, Professor uh, French, is this opportunity to not just like be an important voice at City Hall. And I always tell my constituents that my job isn't uh, to show you how power, how much power I have in City Hall. My job is to show you how much power you have in City Hall in a way that will hopefully continue to act on our city far after I cease to be the mayor. Wow, I, I'm gonna transition to, uh, to, to another set of questions for our, for our guests and might as well just jump right into it. Uh, we all witnessed 
everything that happened last summer. Uh, I mean, it, it inspired passionate voices for change everywhere, uh, not just in the United States, not just in, in the Twin Cities, but people who I, I have friends in, in uh, Kenya, others in Taiwan, everywhere. Um, how, the ways in which we've been reckoning with race and, and, the politi- and, and our political landscape and everything that's part of the social fabric that we have, everything's been, been under scrutiny. So the, the questions I have for each of you, you know, what lessons ha- have you drawn from what we've been through to make us a better union? You know, h- how, do we, how do we tackle some of these questions, these matters of race in, in, in the upcoming year? And is there a special framework? Is there something special about what, what's happened in, in, in Minnesota, what's happened in, in the Twin Cities that can serve to guide us? So well, I have a few thoughts that'll echo the comments the mayor just made. You know, one is, for me, moving to St. Paul in the middle of this crisis, you know, to a new city, really drove home for me two ideas that might seem paradoxical, but I think, I think they're both true. They're not really in conflict. One is there are some inequities and patterns of injustice in this country that are experienced in amazingly similar ways, like you know, real estate redlining and environmental dumping and putting highways through the heart of communities of color. Um, but there also are some really specific historical and cultural attributes in U.S. cities and regions that affect the way we think about and talk about racism in those places that are specific and unique. Um, And it's important to understand these in order to have a meaningful and productive conversation to advance our thinking about the remedies and approaches to healing that are appropriate in those places. So you mentioned this before, Provost Vincent, I don't think we can really get understand the pain experienced here in the Twin Cities over George Floyd's murder unless we're also thinking about the fact that the community is still grieving the killing of Jamar Clark in, in 2015 and the killing of Philando Castile in 2016, and that these deaths compounded our grief when Dante Wright was killed the same week that the Shogun trial was wrapping up. So all of that, you know, and so while I understand why we sometimes think about last summer as a time of reckoning or shock, I think it's also important for us to be really clear that for communities of color, you know, we've been saying for generations, stop harming us. Um, So, you know, it may have been shocking for some people or reckoning for some people who who maybe previously were unaware of or couldn't see the inequities in the violence. But and they have now been forced to reckon because a brave young woman took out her phone and took a video of a man getting killed in broad daylight by police. Um, So what guide needs to guide our thinking now is, I think, a sense of shared purpose, like, okay, now that the people who couldn't see before can see, (laughs) we've got a shared responsibility now. Uh, to, to work together, to, to, to paraphrase Angela Davis, to change what we can no longer accept. Now, I think none of us can accept this. It's time to move forward together. And I, I, I can agree with that more. I mean, one of the fundamental kind of beliefs that I have uh, is that nothing new happened in 2020, right? Uh, as we think about all the things that happened in 2020, none of it's really new. A bunch of people got sick and couldn't access the medicine or health care they needed to, to be able to weather that storm. A bunch of people lost their jobs. A bunch of people lost their homes. Uh, a, a unarmed Black man was killed by police and people were upset about it. None of that is new. We, we experienced it maybe uh, with this uh, compound uh, concentration uh, that makes us makes it such that we can't turn our head away, but none of it is new. Years ago, right before I ran for mayor, we had a group of folks who visited Boston and we we're having a conversation in Boston, by the way, and uh, uh, President Rivera mentioned Darnella Frazier who filmed uh, the, the murder of George Floyd. Now, I think she deserves a Pulitzer and I just say that every time her, her name comes up. Uh, so I just wanted my, my plug. If any of you are on the Pulitzer committee, I think she deserves a Pulitzer. Um, but, um, we visited um, Baltimore and they were having a conversation about uh, everything that happened after uh, Freddie Gray was killed and the protests and the riots that happened in Baltimore after Freddie Gray was killed. And so person, we were talking to political leaders and educational leaders and business leaders uh, and nonprofit leaders who, always say, who were always saying, we hired differently or we budgeted differently or we decided to enroll differently after this happened. 
And I asked then what I thought was a rhetorical question, which is, we know we have these same types of disparities here in the Twin Cities metro area. How do we make those types of changes before our communities burn? I thought that was a rhetorical question when I asked that question, but the same question is in front of Cleveland. The same question is in front of all of our cities across our country. We know that we have these embarrassing disparities. How do we make these calls? How do we make these shifts before, before we reach these kind of bubbling kind of points? So one of the things, one of our mantras right now is no recovery. We're not interested in a recovery because if recovery means getting back to where we were, getting back to the starting line that we were on for all this type of stuff when 2020 started, no, thank you. We know that we need a much more inclusive, a much more resilient, a much more flexible e economy because if, if we've learned anything in the last year, my grandfather used to always say, if experience won't teach you, nothing will. But if we've learned anything in the last year, we dang sure better have learned that as long as one member of our community can't afford a safe home to shelter in place or to isolate in, as long as one member of our community, one worker can't take a week off of work to care for a sick child or to isolate when the doctor says go into quarantine, as long as one person can't afford to go to the doctor when they think they have uh, symptoms, we are literally all worse off. And so we need permanent solutions to those things, not just bridge, bridge solutions to get us uh, to the point where everybody's vaccinated. We need a fundamentally new way of thinking about our community. Uh, and that's what we're trying to drive in St. Paul, like I alluded to earlier. Uh, it doesn't always work and we get a lot of pushback because we're all used to the things that we're used to. But we have to know that what we're used to is the status quo. What we're used to is disparities. What we're used to is four-year-old children going to bed in poverty, not knowing where they're going to sleep tomorrow, or what they're going to eat tomorrow. And we need to figure out how to get unused to all of the things that we're used to. So those are the conversations we're having in St. Paul right now. And it's, it's, it's fun to be able to have those conversations with leaders like President Rivera, uh, who can help to push those conversations uh, from her post as well. I don't remember what the question was you asked Provost Vincent. Oh, no, no, just, just continue to preach. Did I come close to it? Yeah, we, love, we love it, we love it out here. Um, I'm gonna give uh, Dr. Rivera, uh, if, if there's anything else you'd like to add on that. And then um, we're getting close to that time where we need to open it up to, to the audience yeah. for questions. I might give uh, after that maybe a quick, uh, uh, Dr. French, if you wanna say something uh, to wrap it up, then we're gonna, we're gonna open it up, we're gonna open it up to the Q&A. But Dr. Rivera, would you, uh, would you like to say anything? I, I will just briefly say that I, I know Case Western Reserve cares deeply about the community it exists in too because of my experience there. So I think, you know, I've been trying to be really thoughtful about how colleges and universities can play a role in improving quality of life for the residents of the communities we share. You know, McAllister and CWU both in vibrant metro areas with histories of racial segregation, with violence perpetrated by law enforcement, with all the other deleterious effects of inequality, but campuses have resources, material resources, but also human capital that we can bring to bear, not in a paternalistic way, like the college is gonna walk in and fit the city, but I mean like as neighbors in the city, I think we have a moral duty to work shoulder to shoulder with residents, with municipalities, with mayors, with, with community organizations to deeply engage in civic, life. And I just wanted to draw that parallel between Mac and CWRU because I think we really share that philosophy about our moral obligation to engage for the betterment of everyone. I, I appreciate that very much. And I'd, I'd like to point out that that I know this is an issue that that President, uh, our, our university leadership, including Provost Vincent, I almost called you President Vincent, oh. <laughs> care uh, deeply about because, again, we can't just keep the status quo. We, we can't go back. We have to go forward, as you were saying, Mayor Carter. And I wonder if you could just throw in uh, one other comment or two on, on this relationship that President Rivera was just highlighting of universities to their communities. Is, is there more that you can tell us that we can learn about that? Yeah, well, without a doubt. Uh, so when I was in, um, um, I think 11th grade, I challenged an a English teacher one day uh, that if somebody ever, if I'm ever on a job, on a job interview, uh, I kid you not, I said this, I'm, I'm embarrassed that I did. But if I'm ever on a job interview and the interviewer asks me to differentiate between the subject and the verb, I'll come and buy you, I'll come back and buy you flowers, right? 
Um, and I was being a jerk, but I was also challenging her to tell me like, why do I need to know this? Why is it relevant to my life, right? Literally that same semester, and I ended up going to college on the track and field scholarship. So as the high school student, track and field was like uh, uh, a, uh, a religion for me that literally that same semester, my physics teacher uh, asked me, um, if you were going to maximize your long jump length, at, at what angle would you take off? Um, and all of a sudden, I'm telling the rest of the kids, like, shut up, Mr. Butchko is saying something important, right? <laughs> and so I say that to say that academia, uh, you guys, right? Like, and in some ways, the, the more prestigious a university is, uh, the more there are people who live three blocks away from you who think you're irrelevant to community life, to the, to the, uh, everyday challenges that they go through on, in community life. Uh, I actually think this is an incredible opportunity for academia. This is an incredible opportunity for universities. Here in St. Paul, we're a college town. You know, We have all of these colleges. And for the past generation, our highest ask of our college students has been, don't puke in the bushes, right? Um, whereas like, there's an opportunity for us to engage our students to say, wait a minute, what I've been telling you, the biggest challenge is thinking, is, is bringing a new line of thinking uh, to old problems. And if that's not an opportunity for universities to kind of step in and again, that's really critical. We're talking about reimagining public safety. What, 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 what would a public safety out, what would a public safety system that was centered around outcomes, what would that look like for our country? Like, what would it be like for our country? What I know is that when I think about America's public safety system, I think about prisons, police, and prosecutors, which all come into play after something terrible happens. When I think about keeping my daughter who's throwing her blocks all over the floor right now, when I think about keeping her safe, it's 100% about how we take action before something terrible happens to keep something terrible from happening in the first place. So that says to me, we have to like completely reverse the polarity of our public safety system. We have to completely reverse the polarity of our economic system in, in a system in which we could simultaneously in 2020 experience like stock market, like record stock market returns and all of our 401ks doing better than ever, being valued better than ever while having like record unemployment, record homelessness, record hunger uh, in our communities at the exact same time. That means stuff is broken and we need a, a way to approach all of these old problems uh, with all these old traditional ways of thinking that we're used to with a brand new line of thinking. And there is nobody like Case Western Reserve. There's nobody like academia. There's nobody like our universities uh, who are better equipped to help us guide us in that process, which is completely relevant to the right now challenges. And I think if you do that, I think if you lean into that type of work, you'll uh, attract the imagination. You'll capture the imagination of a broad, diverse, forward-thinking set of students who might otherwise never have looked Case Western Reserve's way. Yeah, and I'm gonna just brag on the mayor here and say one thing he didn't tell you is when he put me on this public safety commission, he also put a McAllister first year student on it. And so the, the point here being that this is how we build intergenerational coalitions designed to create the future we imagine because that first year student is now deeply engaged in the work of making a healthier, safety, safe, safer St. Paul. And also I wouldn't doubt that he could be a mayor someday. Wonderful. Uh, and I'm gonna follow Provost Vincent's lead here and go ahead and open it up because I am certain that we do have a lot of folks who'd like to join in this conversation. I'll start with a question that came in electronically. Um, and this is for you, Mayor Carter from Sandy Frazier. And the question is, uh, first of all, she says, thank you for this online dialogue. Uh, the question uh, is, there have been great community outreach efforts from the local Baha'i Center in St. Paul to the citizens. Will there be further dialogue and collaborative efforts with the Baha'is? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, you know, you know, one of the great things about St. Paul that you look, I always tell folks, whatever your preconceived notions are of St. Paul are probably 100 percent true, like 40 years ago, uh, because folks don't assume when I meet them uh, that uh, we're a city in which like our public schools kids speak over 100 different languages at home. Right. People don't assume that we're a city that's a majority of communities of color. And the truth is, we don't assume it. And so that's actually a centerpiece of the conversation that we're having, uh, whether it's engaging our Baha'i people, our uh, Karim people, our Somali people, our Hmong communities, our uh, East African, our uh, historic African-American, 
whatever it is, uh, our uh, larger Puerto Rico, Puerto Rican and Mexican communities that all exist kind of right in this community, uh, right side by side. One of the reasons I think that we have the disparities that we have in St. Paul is because uh, we have tried to govern this like super diverse multilingual community with a very a non-diverse set of elected leaders, a very non-diverse set of voices helping to make the decisions at the table. And so, you know, th th that is absolutely at the center of our theory of change for our city uh, is, like I said earlier, this notion uh, that we just we just don't even know what we can be or who we can be as a community without directly and proactively and energetically uh, and consistently engaging everybody in every corner of our community. So the shortest answer to that question is yes, absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And uh, those of you in the audience, uh, if you can use your hand raising little icon thing, that would help me out a great deal to call on you. It's under reactions at the bottom of your screen. It says raise hand. So that would be helpful. Um, while we're looking for those, though, I would like to see if uh, President Rivera would also like to comment. You were saying about how important it was to bring all these different voices. Uh, this has been a theme, bringing the voices to the table. Uh, you have probably, um, from the moment you've gotten there, uh, had to have a steep learning curve to find out how many new communities are there in this, this place that you have had to move to in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah, it's, it's been tough. I mean, I think we all did the best we could, but, you know, having things closed because of the pandemic has meant that we've, we could only interact by Zoom screen or by being together in person, but with a mask on. So, and, and we all know that, that Zoom is better than nothing, but it's made it very hard to navigate the kind of emotionally charged conversations we need to be having right now when you don't have the full benefits of body language and facial expression and everything. Um, we need to have deep vulnerable sharing if we're gonna actually build the kind of trust that's required to do the repair work that we have in front of us. Um, so I'm really looking forward to things opening up so that I can really in, in greater earnest start that demonstration of trustworthiness that's required to build relationships. And that's gonna require me leaving this campus and going out into the community, not sort of expecting people to come on to, you know, there are people who grew up in St. Paul who don't even know what McAllister is. And I, I find that appalling every time people tell it to me and I see the, the mayor nodding his head. Um, just like in Cleveland, there are people in East Cleveland who would never dream of, of aspiring to be a student at Case Western Reserve. We gotta turn that around. And one way we do it is to break down the geographic barriers by thinking about ourselves as citizens of the greater community and not just merely members of a campus community. So yeah, important work ahead for sure. And I, I know here at Case Western, um, Provost Vincent supports a program called Provost Scholars, which uh, takes students all the way down to middle school. So middle school and high school students in East Cleveland and pairs them up with uh, faculty and staff at Case Western as mentors. And a lot of that is, is, you know, we're not necessarily recruiting them for case per se. We're just talking about what is the journey that you may be on uh, that, that leads to higher education uh, wherever you will succeed. And of course, we're, we're thrilled uh, to have that opportunity and many more besides to try to connect directly to our next door neighbors. Uh, so the next uh, point that uh, is uh, coming up, we are almost out of time, but I did want to note, note that in the chat, uh, it was brought up that maybe we should be thinking in terms of actual mandatory education uh, in public schools, in K through 12, for example, that hones in directly on some of these questions about history of America, the real history of America, uh, and uh, civics, and how we have these kinds of dialogues, that that needs to start much earlier if we want to have the kind of citizen engagement that uh, both of you have been talking about as vital. Um, Mayor Carter, would you like to comment on that? Without a doubt, I think that's so important. Uh, and I'd even go further to say, I think you need to learn how, like what our local units of government do. Uh, I always tell folks that I'm passionate about municipal governance because if you think about the complex issues of our day that stimulate our cerebral core, like that's the state capital. But if you think about like the stuff that just pisses you off uh, and I uh, substantiate that based on like, I, I always challenge people, think about in the last two weeks, 
the, the things that have impacted your life so immediately, so intimately that you just like growl involuntarily, just, uh, right? I can almost guarantee you uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, potholes, uh, it's a vacant building, uh, it's, you know, tall grass and weeds, it's neighborhood crime, it's graffiti. If you think about the stuff that just pisses you off, you would go to city hall to address some of those types of things. Um, I think we teach civics uh, in a way that tells us who signed what documents in the 1700s, but doesn't tell us, never tells us who to call if, there, if there's a vacant building on our, on our block or if there's a, the, the street light uh, is out on our block. Uh, and to me, that feels like uh, going to driver's dead and reading Henry Ford's autobiography. Like we have to do it a fundamentally different way uh, if we want young people to be users uh, and drivers of our public systems and our public services. I agree. And I, I think we just need more honesty through the whole system, not just K through 12, but also in college. You know, I think we've got to find more ways to tell the truth, even when it's uncomfortable, maybe especially when it's uncomfortable. You know, I, there's a lot of debate on college campuses about how much to emphasize, you know, so-called safe spaces, ver quote unquote, versus free speech. And I think that that's such a, a red herring because that we got to get the blinders off everybody and be willing to talk openly about injustice, um, sit with that discomfort, but capitalize on this opportunity to work together because the, the old, you know, what Mayor Carter said about decision makers making decisions that benefit them is true. And similarly, it typically has been, quote unquote, the victors who've written history. And so what we, what we need to do is unlearn some of the uh, untruths we've been taught and look with clear eyes at what is actually happening and be willing to sit with how uncomfortable that makes us so that we can be moved to take action to fix the problems we're facing. Well, I know we have more questions out there and with such a topics on our, on our plate today, how could we not? Uh, they, I hope you will all look at chat and think about some of the other issues that people have, have raised uh, in light of what they've heard today. But I'd like to throw it now back to uh, Provost Vincent, if you could close us out. Professor, can I just make literally 30 seconds, one more thing? I mean, and I see can. the question, <laughs> I appreciate it. I'm sorry, but I see the question um, by uh, Michelle Sylvester. And I think that's so quite, that's so important. Uh, and it goes along with what President Rivera was just saying. I think the only solution is to talk to each other, is to literally talk to each other and literally listen to one another, literally share space, share oxygen, share a meal, whatever it is, and like engage with each other because we're all so embedded in our story and our experience that sometimes it's hard to realize, like, like I'm actually fighting for the same thing as you. Uh, where police accountability is concerned, like the folks who are like, say, look, like, uh, you know, Officer Chauvin, he gets his day in court, you know, don't declare him guilty, you know, ahead of time prematurely, you know, don't be the judge, jury, executioner, like give him his due process. Um, I say like, all of that makes sense. That's exactly what we're saying George Floyd should have had access to, right? So we should be able to talk to one another, but we end up talking past one another. And to me, Every opportunity we have, when I got elected, one of our one of my professors, who's actually a, uh, one of my mentors, who's a former McAllister professor, uh, said, look, just never forget that every body you meet, every senior citizen, every single mom is a subject matter expert in American life. Um, and I think, you know, what happens is that people come into our universities and it's like this textbook is the expert and this professor is the expert, as opposed to like we all have something to learn from one another. Um, and that to me is where the richness lies. And we're never going to find a one, any one textbook that tells all of those stories and all of the same on all the ways that we need them told. But like if we like channel and really mine the richness of diversity that exists in our communities, in our cities, in our universities, in our classrooms, et cetera, uh, we can like really get there. I think a lot faster and a lot more um, um, and, and, and in a much more fulfilling way. Well, Mayor Carter. Uh, President Rivera, uh, wow, what an incredible, incredible conversation we have had today. I feel like we have, uh, we have leaped forward closer to our North Star uh, due to this conversation. It, is, it has been a tremendous, tremendous dialogue. I wish we had another hour uh, for you today. Um, I, I just want to thank everyone uh, for coming out, spending your lunch hour with us here and uh, those of us in, in the East Coast and on Cleveland. Uh, I want to thank uh, Rob Solomon for, for your support. 
um, Shannon, Dr. Shannon French, uh, your support and uh, the Inamori uh, Ethics Center support. Uh, again, Cuyahoga County uh, Public Library here in, uh, in, in Cleveland. Thank you. Uh, I know we also have the City Club uh, uh, was, has been uh, invited as well. So thank you as well for, for your support. Um, but, you know, I've got to say uh, to both of our distinguished guests, um, there is far more uh, on your horizon. I, I can just, I can feel it. And I know together you're going to accomplish great things out there in St. Paul, con uh, continuing to guide the rest of the nation. Uh, I've been getting a few uh, notes on the chat as well. Um, uh, uh, let me say President Carter uh, or Senator Carter, Governor Carter, you, 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 your platform is, uh, is definitely looking fantastic. So uh, uh, you, you, have, you have allies here in Cleveland. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, we, again, this is concludes our North Star seminar series for this year. We want to welcome you again next year uh, when we hope to bring similar programming to you. Please look out for announcements. Uh, in the meantime, please uh, stay safe, have an enjoyable summer, uh, and let's get through this pandemic together. Uh, thank you, everyone. Take care.